today that might help you in the future. And that is part of what I'm interested in. I mean, it says ThoughtWorks, I work for ThoughtWorks. Some of you, or many of you might have heard about the company. One of the key things we want to do is not only help the clients, we are a consulting company, but we also want to help influence the industry and try to bring good practices that we see as consultants to many other companies that we don't work with, because obviously we can't work with all companies. If you do want to work with us, or if you want to <laughs> apply, please approach me as well. So, but today, we're going to talk about microservices at the microservices meetup with a split favor on front ends. And I want to, well, I have separated that talk into two parts. The first part is, what were they thinking? A little bit about the background, but then the bulk of the talk is going to be about specific patterns for micro front -end. But I think it is important to understand where this is coming from. We start here at some point, the good old layered architecture. And I guess you've all seen that. You've seen diagrams like this, I guess. You've heard people talk about themselves as, I am a DBA, I am a Java developer or I am a front-end developer, or even a mobile developer. I always find these sentences a bit, I don't know how to say it. I find them a bit weird. It is not the defining characteristic of a person that they program in Java at the moment. There is nothing inherent about you being a programming or a programmer in a certain language. But somehow the industry, for one reason or another, really worked with that layered model for quite a while, and lots of architecture diagrams are layered like that. What I've tried to show here with the boxes is that there are these points, these cracks, where the two layers meet. And in many organizations I've seen that, and I guess many of you have also seen that, extra communication is needed. Inside a layer, communication works really well. Between the layers, it is much more difficult, it causes friction. And one of the things that friction results in is, of course, delays. And that is really what most of us don't want today. What we want is we want to make a change and have that visible in productive use as fast as possible. So those layer boundaries really hurt us. And this is not just anecdotal evidence. I mean, Melvin Conway formulated that idea in the late 60s already, and he said that the team structures will reflect the software architecture, and there's not much you can do about it. In fact, he was slightly wrong about the last bit. I mean, he was completely right about the first bit. It's like Newton's law, and it's not that you can say Mel Conwin was wrong and I don't care about his law. The thing is it was a description like Newton's law about something that is inevitably going to happen. But what you can do is you can use Conway's law to your advantage. What you can say is if the team structure will be reflected in the software architecture, what I want is I want a solution, a mobile a feature in the mobile application that requires some backend functionality and some data storage. I want to deliver that fast. You can put the people you need into the same team, right? And this is exactly what we did. This is what the whole industry started doing about, I don't know, five years ago to say, let's go away from those layers and let's go into those more vertically oriented architectures. There's different names for it. Sometimes people call it verticals. Our colleagues here in Germany, in, in always get them confused, in OQ, they wrote about self-contained systems. I think there's a lot of good material on that website that also talks about the approach. But really what it resulted in was to say, we want to have these individual services, and we happen to call them microservices for one reason or another. And these services are owned by a team and they can work independent of each other. That is the most important thing, that the boundaries are not like this anymore, but the boundaries are like that. So if I want to release a new feature, the team responsible for those services can do that completely on their own. This is what I wrote there on the left-hand side. The key word here is independent, evolvability. All of those services can evolve independent of each other. You reduce friction, you increase, sorry, you decrease cycle time, and therefore you make your business more competitive. What we did see, though, was something like that. And that gray line here is meant to say this is the boundary. This is running on the servers in the data center or the cloud, which is also a data center, obviously, and this is running in the web browser. And that's what a lot of people thought microservices were that you kind of split up the application you have on the server side into lovely services, and the more the better, that was also something that we heard, and the smaller the better, that's also what we heard. This is not what anybody meant. The people originally designing and talking about microservices 
and that was an article that Martin Fowler, my colleagues Martin Fowler and James Lewis wrote, they talk about nine different criteria. I encourage you to go back now in hindsight, five years later, to see how that semantic diffusion changed it and how much microservices really just mean as many as possible, as small as possible. That is not the intent. But anyway, people did that and they created those and forgot about the front end. And then, at some point, people started talking, the front started talking about the front end monolith. This big thing in the front end, and I did this deliberately with the colors here to see that the functionality is really smeared across. Whatever is done by the orange services here is somewhere in the monolith, and the blue stuff is somewhere here, and sometimes it kind of mixes, you don't really know. In our experience, and as a consulting company, we see quite a few clients, we see different implementations, we saw this a lot. And in all honesty, this is the worst you can possibly do. You get all the overhead of running microservices. That's also often forgotten. Microservices create overhead on the server. It's much harder to operate 50 microservices than one monolith. I mean, ask the Stack Overflow people about it. They write about having a monolith, and they're quite happy with it. But anyway, there are reasons why you want to do microservices, as you know. But if you do so, you incur the overhead here. But because of all that um, monolith here in the front end, you don't get the benefits, because you can't deploy independently anymore. If I want to make a change to features in that yellow bit of business capability, I have to redeploy the monolith. And I have all the dependencies again. So I have the dependencies of a monolith, and I have the extra overhead of the microservices. So don't do that. That really is a terrible, terrible idea. It was so common, and I don't know how many of you know this, at ThoughtWorks we published this thing called the Technology Radar, where twice a year we highlight 100 things that we came, up, roughly, <laughs> that we came across in the previous six months. And in one meeting, we talked about this problem and thought about there's a category on the radar that says hold, don't do these things. And we thought about putting the front end monolith on hold. But generally in those discussions, what we're saying is we do want to, we do want to put something positive into the recommended part and not something bad in the stay away from it. Sometimes we have to put something in the stay away. So we thought and we brainstormed in the group and we said, let's invent a new word for what we all thought was obvious, that the services here have their own front ends, but apparently people misinterpreted it. They thought microservices were just server side and the front end carried on. So we said, let's invent a new word, and born was the word micro front ends. It was a meeting of that group where we decided to come up with the word, and you can read the text, I'll give you a second to read the text, that in which we explained the motivation for inventing this. So it was really not, it's probably too low, I guess. The, anyway, the idea is we motivated the whole thing here, not by saying we have discovered something new, but by saying what, what we saw in the industry, what we saw happen a lot, is not what was intended with microservices. They were not meant to be like that, but it seemed that a new term was needed to get people more used to the idea that we have that split on the server side as well in the web browser. So that was, quite a while ago, I forget. November 2016, so three years ago. And in those three years, we've seen a lot of patterns on how to do these microservices well. And in all fairness, we've seen those patterns before, because as I said, the concept was always there. If you look, if you could, you can probably with the web archive, if you go back to some of the things that were said about self-contained systems, it was always clear to them as well that the front end was part of the self-contained system of the vertical. So it's probably going back further than that. I do want to talk about five patterns, four or five patterns in total, and I'm going to start with the simplest one. That doesn't mean the simplest one is the worst. Quite the contrary. As so often, the simplest pattern is the best one. If you could possibly use the simplest pattern, please do it. I'm only showing you the really complex one at the end to say that you can do microservices under almost any circumstance. But please try to use this one, which is the web approach. So a lot of this is based on real work. I have anonymized everything, and everything is coming in terms of a shopping application where you can buy trainers. And let's assume you have business capabilities, and service one, the blue service, is what is often called in e-commerce circles the article detail page. That is where you can have a look at the detail of the article that you think about buying. It's different from search, for example. It's something that I've seen on quite a couple of e-commerce implementations. 
And the other one here, the yellow one, is probably called order capture oftentimes, where you capture the order. You don't need to know that much about the product, the SKU maybe, and the price, because the price might change, or the things in the basket, and so on. So there's a couple of things you need to know, but they're quite distinct business capabilities. One is rendering high-fidelity information about a product. The other one is about capturing an order from a user. And again, if you look back at the definition of microservices, they talk about services being a business capability, a microservice standing for a business capability. So that thing looks like a really, really good split. The best thing you could possibly do when it comes to micro frontends is that that service that renders the article, sorry, that is responsible for the article detail page, that it also renders the HTML. Server-side rendering is placed in the web browser. And then ideally, and I know it won't work, but ideally, we would have a button here that says, I want to buy this pair of trainers. And what happens with the web is there's a hyperlink, you go into a different URL, which is now rendered by service two, and that renders the shopping cart and that says, thank you very much for putting this into the shopping basket. Do you want to pay? Do you want to continue shopping? That way, you have the user interface by the two different services completely separate. It is obvious, I guess, for all of you, how you can deploy service number two without impacting service number one at all. It is just the web. I can deploy one website and I don't impact the other one. You can get actually quite far with this, and also these pages here don't have to be completely static and server-side rendered. You can include some JavaScript, you can include some HTML rendering, some client-side rendering, and so on. The idea, though, to say, let's have a hyperlink separate the two services is quite a powerful one, and it's often underestimated. When you are in a B2C context, oftentimes this doesn't work because your users have high expectations and they are used to certain features on websites. And one of them is something like this here, a mini shopping cart. You probably on the article detail page, you still have a shopping cart that often lists information like you have five items in there or maybe even the price depending on what kind of website you're building. So what you can do here is pattern number two. You still have server-side rendering, <coughs> which is common, of course, in high-traffic websites that can be search engine optimized. So you do server-side rendering, but you use server-side composition. So service number one, the article detail page, renders HTML, and here it leaves a little gap. And that gap usually comes in form of an SSI, a server-side include, or ideally actually an edge-side include. Edge-side includes do everything that SSI, server-side includes do. They're a bit more standardized, and they also allow you, when you switch to a content delivery network, to do that more transparently. This is actual code at the top, and I guess all of you can program to some degree. It's very, very easy to do, right? The blue service just renders the ESI include and says, I want the contents of that URL in this spot. And then if you have Varnish, Nginx, there's the common choices, there's other choices obviously as well. When they send back the HTML byte stream, they encounter the edge side include, they do resolution, they go here, they pull in the HTML from service number two, splice that into the byte stream of the HTML that is streamed to the browser. When this service has finished rendering HTML, they continue with the rest of the HTML from the other service. The browser is number wiser, the browser sees one HTML page, and it understands that and can render it. And still, I guess it's obvious to see here how you have that independent evolvability. You can render, or sorry, you can redeploy either of those services, and clearly you don't have to redeploy the other one. I hope that makes sense. The next one, oh sorry. Hmm. I like this slide, I thought about this. <laughs> There's a lot of myth, and people have said this, oh, but server-side composition, this is so old school, you can't do it, and we have to have tracking pixels, or we have to have cache times, if you can. these are two examples. And there's all these myths where people are saying you can't do this, you can't compose pages on the server side. And the two most common ones that I heard were dynamicness, like some form of dynamicness, and the other one, cache times. And what I've done here, this is actually code that I wrote probably five years ago, four or five years ago, this is Varnish configuration. So if you know Varnish very well, and you think this is wrong, maybe the newer versions of Varnish have a slightly different syntax, but this was, I promise, valid Varnish code. And what you can see in the first section up there, in the first eight lines, especially in line four and six, you can see how you can set the time to live for the individual page fragments to different times. So what I can say is, if, I, if there's a regex here in line two, right? If the URL matches page, I want a 30 second time to live on the caching. However, if the request URL contains slash track, I don't want any caching at all. So with that server-side composition, the individual fragments you're creating can have different cache times. And 
I guess if you have enough traffic, you definitely want caching. Usually in the order of batting, if you have thousands of requests per second, then that is a really great cache ratio already. And again, like just to give an example, you can do some clever tricks as well. If the URL matches track, we are creating this made up HTTP code 999, and at the bottom we can match on it, and in Varnish you can even create some synthetic HTML here, so I can insert something that is different in each single request, even though this is server-side rendered, it's server-side composed, and everything can be cached. So, if somebody says to you, I can't do server-side, or the caching doesn't work, or server-side composition doesn't work, really try to understand what features you're implementing and have a look at Nginx and Varnish. These are the tools that I saw work. I don't know, there's a lot of literature around it. There's a lot of people on Stack Overflow who can answer your questions. You can do a lot that people will tell you you can't. What is difficult, though, when you do the server-side composition is what you do with the assets. I mean, where do the PNG files go, the CSS, how do you join everything up? And there's actually a quite good talk, because I mean, I, I can't really go into detail here. If you want to see that, there's a long URL. So people talked about an approach that was taken by, um, by a company here in Munich, actually, of how they used mod page speed to actually use that. There's different approaches you can do. I know that, I think the people at Otto in Hamburg, the big e-commerce website, they also talked about their approach, which is why it was different. They had a different static asset server, they copied everything there. So there's different approaches, but that is something that I will say is something, there's no simple answer, there's no silver bullet, you have to deal with it somehow. <coughs> Oftentimes, duplication helps. I mean, if you have a company logo, it is probably okay that each individual microservice has its own copy. In the event that you change your corporate logo, you have to make a special effort that all the people have the same PNG file exchanged with the same time roughly, but I think that's okay, because you don't change corporate logos, I don't know, several times a week. But you might, and in case I know this for Otto, they do more than 500 deploys every week. And they work like 37 and a half hours, and they only deploy during working hours, and they do several hundred releases in production every week. And then, yeah, changing the logo is really not your top concern, although it will, come, it will be brought up in these cases. So, a slight detour. It's mostly a made up example, but it is based on this idea of a classified page that I guess if you know Autoscout or Mobility, then you have one team that does a classified page, right? And at some point they want the information about the dealer below the car. And now I think you are the team who's implementing this. And you are the blue team that has the classified page, and you want to render that page, and then you discover there's a different team. They have the details already for all the contracts. And then you discover even better, not only do they have the details, they also have an HTTP endpoint. They have an API, and it's REST, and it's JSON, and everything is going to be beautiful. And you discover this, and you can see you get the dealer information in this format. You'll probably notice if you look, and I'll point you to it now, the postcode is a number, because in Germany, of course, postcodes are numbers, they are not strings. And you discover this, and you think everything is great, it's APIs, and we can talk to each other, we don't have to talk to the people, we can talk to the endpoint, we don't have to disturb them, so what do we do? We consume the API, we take the JSON that they provide so nicely, we take that JSON, and we render it, and we put the dealer information under the picture of the vehicle that we are advertising. That all works very well, and it feels like you have done all the right things, right? JSON, HTTP, REST, endpoints, and so on and so on. Unfortunately, what you have not looked at is independent evolvability. What you've done is you've coupled those two services together. And that becomes very apparent when this company expands into the UK. And the contact detail service now starts dealing with UK addresses. Now the JSON suddenly looks like this. And they deploy without telling you, because that's the idea, right? You work independent of each other. And suddenly the JSON, it made a small change, the postcode is now a string, because in the UK, postcodes are strings. And also, I don't know how much you are familiar with UK addresses, the house number doesn't really go past the street name, it is in front of the street name where it is correct. And we see the null here, because of course we assumed it was a number, and we're trying to pass the string as a number, and then some framework makes it into the string bracket open, and ULL, close bracket. So what happened is, we are deployed independent of each other, which was the goal, but you had created this nasty unseen dependency. Arguably, a better approach would have been this one. When first, 
the contact detail service started being um, deployed on, they can create an API. Maybe there are reasons why people need the data. But I think it is underestimated how much semantic information is encapsulated in the data, and that is still some coupling. So ideally, <coughs> they would have created a micro front end, if you will. What they would have created is an HTTP endpoint that can return user interface, HTML. And some semantic stuff, just paragraphs, and you can somehow style them later. Maybe you can have an agreement in the company, there's something called BEM, like a notation or an agreement on how to name CSS classes and so on. They could have put a special class here so you can style it, but usually you find other ways too. You can put it in a container of your choice and then you know how to style it. Anyway, the key idea is rather than returning JSON REST, they return boring old HTML. And what you do here is the classic part page, now rather than calling them at runtime, you include an edge site include, or you they render an edge site include, that makes a call to the service and it includes the pre-made HTML fragment. And now, when they go to England, nothing bad happens because they know, this is, this is the business capability, they know about addresses, they should have the front end, and they know, and they know that it needs to be rendered like this. The house number before the street name, the postcode after the street name, and in that formatting. And now they are truly independent, right? because they have provided a front end, a micro front end, that was only used by this service, they are really independent. This change would happen without them ever talking to each other. You might argue, that is not a front end, right? And it doesn't feel like a front end, but conceptually it is already. It is something that is user presentable, and that is the whole idea for the microservices, to push the user presentable stuff as far as possible into the service, and to rely as little as possible on consuming JSON data from others and then have the rendering of the HTML or the user interface in multiple different places. So, back to the main example. Another thing that I've seen quite often is this one here. It's very similar to the server-side composition except the composition happens on the client side only. So what we're seeing here is the service returns an HTML page, but here we've included some JavaScript now when the JavaScript is executed in the browser, it goes to another service and fetches some HTML, and the HTML is then inserted into a specific spot in the DOM. I mean, to be identified by a path or something else. This is a really, really good example when you have very high traffic websites. I mean, the first time I saw this was when we did a website for a TV show, and almost everything was deployed as static site-generated HTML. But there was still the need to include something here at the top to say, hello, Eric, welcome back, or you have five unlocked episodes, or this is the person you voted for, and so on. So there needs to be a little bit of dynamic, uh, yeah, dynamic HTML, dynamic user interface, and it was done in that way. So at least the bulk of the page could be rendered as fast as possible, and that service only really needed to serve HTML, so that was almost always up. And if there was service deteriora deterioration, then that piece wouldn't be shown, but that actually rarely happened. It was a nice way of separating it. But as I said, today, you don't see that much server-side rendering anyway. A lot of the HTML is rendered in the client, and that pattern, as I said, is not so common. What is more common is a variation of this, <coughs> where the service here actually renders a page, and then it downloads JavaScript from a different service. So this service now doesn't provide HTML, it doesn't use server-side rendering, it provides JSON that is being sent to the browser, and that JSON then makes a request, sorry, JavaScript, and that JavaScript then makes a request, downloads the JSON, and does some client-side rendering. That again is an example that is quite useful for a statically rendered website. This is actually code from my own personal website, which is all, I mean, I, I used WordPress at some point in time and I was so tired of updating it and all the security problems that a few years ago I switched to a statically generated site. But I still wanted to have some, I wanted to show, for example, the GitHub repositories I've been working on. And again, the same pattern applies. This is all statically returned from a very, very simple website, from a web server. And here and there you can see there's a function that says, um, do something, go to the GitHub API, get some information, and then put it into the hash personal repos, which is the div up there. So again, the website can be completely statically rendered, it never really changes, but each time the user loads it, in the browser some JavaScript is executed, that loads some JSON, and then does some uh, client-side rendering, and inserts it at the right spot in the page. 
So now, these were the four simple patterns. Now let's get to the slightly more complicated one. And this is what a lot of people are asking about, is what if I have a single page application? I actually put PWA there too. Anything or everything I'm going to show you doesn't need something specific of a progressive web application. It is just because oftentimes I'm not even sure anymore whether people make that distinction. What I, what I mean by this really is an application that really renders almost exclusively the HTML in the web browser, where there's hardly any support, <coughs> actually no server-side rendering of HTML code. And what you really want to do is you have this composed single page application that is running. You have one service, service one, that returns the minimal HTML. I don't know how many of you have seen this. If you have a React application, there's very, very little HTML that is being sent, like the first piece is like maybe 10 lines, actually less when you take all the comments out. So there's minimum HTML, and then it immediately starts to download some JavaScript, and that JavaScript generally then goes, fetches some JSON data, and then the JavaScript uses the JSON data to render some HTML that makes up the application. And now, as I've said, we want to split this, we want to have service number two also have its own user interface. So it needs to send its own JSON, and only this JSON, uh, sorry, this JavaScript, and this JavaScript is allowed to fetch the JSON from the service. We really want the two of them separated. And that's, I can't stress this enough, this is completely crucial because you're only one step away from anti-pattern number one, which is this one, the front-end monolith. I go back and forth so you'll see the difference. And it's only that little bit of JavaScript down here. Oops. If you go to the front-end monolith, this service gives you all the JavaScript, and that JavaScript makes all the calls to the other services in the backend and loads all the data. What that means, if service number two wants to change functionality, they change the API, they return all kinds of data, but now the JavaScript suddenly is done by service number one by the other team, and you have to coordinate with them, and again, you're not independent anymore. So it is really absolutely crucial that only the JavaScript that is coming from a specific service is allowed to fetch data from that service, that you isolate them in that way. And um, another slight detour is, how does that look like on the build side? How do you build these applications? And it does make sense, I promise you, in a second. So let's take the blue service. You have some source code, right? You have some JavaScript. And let's assume we write the, the pieces of software that run on the server in Kotlin, for example. And then we have a build pipeline that is actually creating artifacts out of the JavaScript. In the case of, say, a REST application, it creates the app.js and app.css, and it also creates a jar file, which is the thing that you need to deploy on the server. This is to come back to this here, right? I mean, at some point, this JavaScript here is the end result of compiling all the JavaScript, goes to the content pipeline, and this thing here that is running on the server side is, if you're doing something with the JVM language, is in a jar file. So, what we've seen quite a bit is anti-pattern number two, and that's the last anti-pattern I'm going to talk about tonight. But I do want to show you this because it's quite common. And that's what happens. And that we've seen this countless times. What people are doing is they're saying, the blue thing, the application, the article detail page, for example, actually needs to include the shopping basket. That was the problem, right? And we wanted that service to create it. Let's forget the shopping basket first. So the build pipeline here takes the JavaScript and the Kotlin files, it runs the build pipeline, and it pushes the app.javascript onto Nginx or some just basic web server, and it also deploys the article detail page jar file somewhere else where Java applications or JVM applications can run. But now you want that shopping cart. So what happens is the pipeline for the shopping cart service actually spits out a jar file that creates the endpoint, the REST endpoint on the server side, but it also spits out app.js, which is the application for the shopping cart. They push it into an NPM registry, maybe something that is on site, Nexus or whatever, or they use a public one, they push it in there, and then the build pipeline of the other service pulls this in. And I've used red color there for a purpose because that is the actual anti-pattern here. What happens because what happens is later in this build pattern here, Everything gets put together, and ultimately you're ending up 
with an FJS file that contains both the article detail page as well as the shopping basket. They all get together. And that really, again, creates a lot of complexity and coupling between the two. <coughs> it makes it difficult to release something if you introduce feature toggles or all sorts of other things. If you want to change the shopping cart, you have to deploy this application. It's clear, right? If you make a change to the yellow bits on the left-hand side, and you change the front-end as well as the stuff that runs on the server, your build pipeline will end here in the NPM registry. You have to start the other pipeline as well to get your JavaScript deployed. And that is really a bad idea. You don't want to have that. You want to be independent. You don't want to have another pipeline to run. Depending on how sophisticated your setup is, this can also take quite a while. And quite a while will be more than, say, 30 seconds or so. I think, at least for me personally, that breaks the flow. If I make a change to a JavaScript file, and I leave the editor, I save the file, and I want to go to the web browser, I have to wait 30 seconds for this pipeline to run quite fast, to push it into registry, for the other pipeline to run, and then some reloading, and I had a long discussion with some of my colleagues um, last week, is it hot reloading or live reloading, and do we all mean the same thing? That aside, it oftentimes just simply takes too long to do this, and that impairs developer productivity on like, a really basic level, where the coding and changing code and actually seeing the browser is really impacted to the point where you're constantly getting pulled out of the flow of development. So these two advantages, sorry, advantages, disadvantages alone really make this a complete anti-pattern. Please, please don't do this. So what else could you do? And what I've seen and I've worked with is an approach that looks more like that. And this is the one that I'm going to show you some code of how to do this. So what you're doing here is up here, you're just deploying this blue thing just deploys its own app.js. It deploys its own backend. And the other pipeline deploys its backend and pushes, almost as a sibling, its own app.js there. And of course, it is very immediately obvious that there's now no coupling. The yellow bits can be deployed. You can trigger the yellow build pipeline. They are the master of their own destiny. Everything will get deployed. The blue people can work, and they are not really interfering. You get that independent evolvability. The question is, why do people do the other one? And, and how does that actually work? How can they sit next to each other? I mean, one thing is you do want, as I said here with Nginx, you need some logic up here, because you want that all on the same host name, on the same domain. So the requests for the JavaScript, as well as the subsequent requests that go to the backend services, they should, of course, all go through some reverse proxy, so it's all on the same domain and you don't get problems. That, that is beyond the scope. But how does it work that you have the two files and you can still combine them? Because you still need to combine them into one application, right? And the example I'm going to show you in more detail now is a React application. I spoke to people who have done Angular and Boo, and you can do very similar things there. So, in the end, what you want is at the very top you see I'm declaring, this is JavaScript obviously, two variables. I'm saying there will be a card preview tile, that is the little preview one that I constantly have on the article detail page, and I have to have a card service route. For those of you who don't do React, that's just one way that, that how React applications work that basically describe the interaction between the URLs and where users click and what transitions are being made. So I'm saying these are externals. I'm in the application that is the outer one, this kind of framing thing, and I'm saying I have external symbols, almost like in the old days when you're linking something. Uh, some externals, they will come from somewhere. I don't know where they're coming from, but they will be there. And I'm declaring this at the bottom here. JavaScript, there's no types, right? It's just an object. And then I have this function here. This is actually more or less verbatim for some production code. It says load front end config, returns a promise, and then with the result of this one, it calls load front end. Let's look into slightly more detail on how that works. This is what load front end config does. And it actually fetches a JSON document from slash API config. And the rest is just error handling and <coughs> authentication. So basically, the front end config is loaded from an HTTP endpoint. And what we did in the <coughs> on the product that I worked on, it wasn't an e-commerce website, by the way, so I've adapted it. The return value of this bit here, what API config was returning, was some JavaScript like this. And there would have been more, obviously, if we didn't only have the shopping cart. 
And we came up with a simple naming convention. We said, there's a name, card, this is the name of your module, or that's also an overloaded term. The name of your service thingy is card, and then there's minus, oh, minus JS, is minus CSS, and what follows are URLs, where you can find those things, right? And then, load front end becomes very, very simple. So you can see in line 21, we're just loading the style sheet. Remember that config is return value, and JavaScript and JSON is all the same. So config is now a dictionary, I can get the value for card CSS, and I can just load the style sheet. So now when the application is initializing in browser, the first thing it does, it gets the config, and then it starts loading the CSS and the JavaScript. So the CSS is being um, loaded here, and here we're loading the CardJS, the JavaScript. The implementation of those two functions, load style and load script, is really boring. In both cases, we basically create a custom, uh, we, not a custom, sorry, to be careful. We create an HTML element and insert it into the DOM, a script element, and that actually loads what is actually behind it. And after that, once the script is loaded here, the card.js, it has a variable in there called exports, and we just ex we take the value of exports and assign it over what was in externals already. So the remember there was the card, uh, the preview tile and the route. These are variables that are declared in here, and we're just copying them over. And then there is a bit of React specificness. They use reducers for state management, when you use Redux. It doesn't really matter so much. The exports also contain some reducers and we add it to the store. But never mind, if you don't know React, it doesn't really matter. What you can see here is that that code is actually specific. We have literal strings in here. If you load five of those micro frontends, it's actually okay to copy those lines five times. If you are in a situation where for one reason or another you load 20 of them, you probably want to write a little bit of an abstraction, but I guess everybody's already thinking in their mind how simple it would be to write that abstraction, right? You have an array, you have a for loop, and then you just take like whatever name, this here becomes a variable, and then we have abstracted them. So ultimately, what we've done here is we have introduced some coupling up there. Which components do we depend on? I think that is totally fair. If I'm writing the article detail page, I don't have to try to hide the fact that I'm going to show a micro shopping basket at the top. That is okay. I'm doing this one off. This coupled, which components would I load? What is decoupled is where to load them from, because I can actually go to the server side and ask the server where should I load them from. And we use that to great effect to increase again the developer experience. I don't know many for you, but many of us use these Apple laptops and they are maxed out at 16 um, gigabytes of memory. If you load a couple of IDEs, and you have a few microservices, you can actually get to the 16 gigabytes quite quickly. If you have 20 microservices, you have a real problem generally. So what we did here is what we did in the config for the framing bit. We said only load the frame itself and the service that I'm working on from localhost, and all the others, we just pointed to the CI environment. So if I was working on one service, I only had to run the backends for that service on my machine because it's all assembled at runtime, even the hot live, whatever reloading you want, did actually work completely. I can save a JavaScript file and in React, the changes are made without even losing the state of the client application. And at the same time, the other pieces that I'm not working on, they are being loaded from the CI environment, the JavaScript, and because that JavaScript is loading from a CI environment, it actually makes a connection back to the backends that are also deployed in the CI environment. In the, you could use also a test or staging environment, whatever you want. But the key idea was, by decoupling where the assets are loaded from, you can in development scenarios split and only have running on your machine what you are working on and everything else can come from somewhere else. And then the last bit here is just some generic code that doesn't really change. And as I said, if, if you find it too wordy, you can probably find a way of making it a bit nicer. But the crucial thing is we've introduced minimal coupling, and everything else is decoupled. I do want to be honest, though. This was not the entirety of the code. I need to have one more slide for the rest of the code. So at some point, what you see here is we have to add um, the service route. I mentioned that before. That's React-specific. Other JavaScript frameworks will have similar mechanisms. But what you see here, <coughs> Because we have assigned what was exported from the JavaScript to this externals object, we can just use that here as if 
it came from the original JavaScript. At that point in time, because JavaScript is all dynamic, at that point in time, nobody knows anymore where the content of this where, where this object came from. Did it come from the JavaScript loaded from the first service, or did it come from the other service? And then very similarly, if I want to use one of the, um, the, the components that was exported, I can begin to say Excel, Scar Preview Tile. This is, if you have done React, it might look a bit unfamiliar, but it's totally valid, and you can do it like that. So again, the outer component, the article detail page, contains this bit of HTML. It says, at this point here, I want the card preview tile, but it doesn't really know. The instance wasn't created by it. The instance was created by loading JavaScript, potentially, from a different server. And of course, again, you want to hide all of this behind a reverse proxy. You don't want that to be, at least from the web browser's perspective, to be different servers, right? I mean, because then you get all the cross-site scripting and all the problems. You want from the, the browser thinks it's one service, but at the bottom, you have a reverse proxy where you fan that out. So we have introduced coupling here, true, but I think again that is fair. This is coupling that I'm doing once. I need to say where do I want that component and how do I want to have the routes. Very briefly, the other side, the side that is actually the component itself, that is very simple. I can just create a file in components.js and say these are the JavaScript symbols, the objects I want to export. And in your build pipeline, I think this was Webpack, if I remember correctly, you could just say create this app.js, and this is the card, like the, the symbol name you assign. And we experimented, there's a couple of different library targets, at least at the time when we did this specific example, the ES6 modules didn't work for us, so we went for a slightly older format. Or, but again, sometimes it is worth trying out what works best for you. Maybe in today's world, this is about two years old, or a year and a half. Maybe today ES6 uh, modules would work equally well. And that's everything. So we see some definitions here at the bottom for all the micro frontends that are being included. And at the top, again, we're seeing some coupling of the outer one that includes, or the, the bit that imports, that needs to use the other micro frontends. But the key thing really is, if you think back, all the coupling is one of We have coupling between them, but after this works once, the service can really work independent. You can deploy that shopping cart thing and the JavaScript loaded from another service without impacting the outer one. Because when you deploy the shopping cart, it's only the content of this that will change, but not the structure itself. So this was the more complicated example. And at some point, we are running out of time. I mean, we do have plenty of time for questions. I do want to, this is almost an FAQ where I've done this talk a couple of times before. These are things I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about framework versions. So I'll preempt your question. I guess you were going to ask that. If you have these micro frontends, it's all loaded dynamically. How many times do you load React? And can you have different versions of React? There is no good answer for this. What I've seen work better is that you agree on one version of React. And I understand that that introduces coupling. And then you have to fiddle a little bit with the pipelines to strip out React that you don't put it into every single app.js. The reason why we found this preferable is the load time, especially on mobile devices. Because if you have an application that is made up of, say, like even five micro frontends, and they all have their own version of React, and you load the React five times, which can increase the load time of the application. There are clever approaches of staggering the loading, or actually, what was the other framework that I saw? Gatsby was a framework that can do some stitching and can just like already preload something while you're looking at something else and can separate. There are tricks around it. But oftentimes, the easier version or the easier approach is to use the same version of React, even though you introduce some coupling, and then take some lessons from the people who have done monorepos for many years. I've personally not totally understood the value of monorepos on the server side, but here, I think it can make sense to say, if we all share the same version of React, and somebody really needs a slightly newer version, it is now their responsibility to make sure that you run the tests, that there is some testing, that the bumping of the React version doesn't negatively impact the other contents. I'm going to move the microphone slide. Well, we can discuss this in more detail later if you want. The other one is web components. I'm super curious about this. Web components have been around for quite a while, like at least four or five years, I think, and it would look like a logical approach to, to doing that. Apparently, there is something in Angular that uses uh, web components. 
there's um, a colleague of mine who was also quite curious, and he um, collaborates with the University of Berlin, and there's actually, he should be finished by now, almost, um, a student in Berlin who wrote his, ma it might have been a bachelor's thesis, I don't know, the thesis on the topic of how you can use web components together with micro frontends. I haven't read it yet, I think it should be finished soon, so we will find out more. But what I can say from just looking around, I see very few people actually using web components still, even though polyfills are there, browsers are supporting it. It is just not something I've seen. If you have something to share later, I'd be very curious to hear if you've used web components to deal with some of the issues I talked about earlier. Authentication obviously comes up. <coughs> now, I mean, remember, we have, if you go, no, I'm not going to go back. But you remember that picture, right, with the two build pipelines? We're deploying the backends, we're deploying all the front ends separately, but somehow you need to make sure that the users are properly authenticated. And the way that we normally see how to do that is that you use some form of SSO, single sign-on technology, whatever service, whatever endpoint you're going to, checks whether you are authenticated. If not, of course, they redirect you. That comes back, and at that point, wherever that service is, they generate a JWT token with a couple of signed assertions, and then wherever you're going, all the services can see the JWT token. They can decrypt it, they can check the signature, and they then know who you are. So that is actually the general approach of doing that. Ideally, what you can also do is, you have to do maybe some, some legwork as well, you can actually take the um, JWT token and um, use an API gateway or some technology. We once did that with Nginx also. We wrote a little enclosure nonetheless, a little module for Nginx that was actually doing all that shared work actually checking the JWT token, making sure it was signed. Of course, if it's not signed, everybody can say I'm admin, right? So you need to check the signature. It was taking out all the information and then further down, including them as plain HTTP headers. And all the microservices knew that they were hidden behind that mechanism and they knew they could trust the HTTP headers. That was really nice from a developer experience. So if I was testing the application, I didn't have to suddenly create all these JWT tokens all the time. I could just add a couple of HTTP headers saying, this is test users or Eric or whatever. And these are my roles, my entitlements or whatever that were in HTTP headers. And at the same time, it was quite secure at runtime. Front-end to front-end communication, that is a talk in itself. Um, the general approach is try not to do it. Because again, you're creating coupling. Oftentimes, it's actually easier for one frontend to talk to its own backend, that backend talk to the other backend, and then back out. Sometimes that's cost prohibitive, in terms not money, but um, in terms of uh, performance. You can do all sorts of things. One thing I've seen, for example, in React applications, when you use Redux, you can have a shared section of the Redux store. The Redux store is basically just an object, right? And normally, what you do is you namespace it, you put Everything for cart, under the cart key, if you will, if you consider the dictionary, and then everything lives underneath that. And then you create a shared one. And then, of course, you're creating a contract between the services, but you know you can change this. And I saw this, we're writing an application for, I can talk about this publicly, an application for Mercedes-Benz that all the dealers are beginning to use now, but all of them will use it soon, uh, to sell cars. If you go to a dealership, they will have iPads, and there's an application there. This uses a very similar approach to what I described. But sometimes you need to communicate. For example, in the sales process, if you what are they again? If you choose a car that can be plugged in, like a plug-in hybrid vehicle, then they might want to sell you a wall box where you can charge the car at home. So that thing that shows some of the tiles in the process, that also needs to understand what car was selected. So what there what the case is there's an event that is being sent. And we're using plain React events in that case. And the other components can listen to the React events. Oftentimes you don't notice that because, and for good reasons, the React events are usually JavaScript constants, as if you use a variable. But, yeah, like a constant, you know what I mean, right? JavaScript doesn't exist. A variable that you can't change the value of, a constant variable. And of course you don't have access to that in the other component because you don't have that symbol. But of course, they're just strings underneath, and you can listen to the events that are sent to other uh, micro frontends. So you can listen, and what, that's exactly what we did there. It said, car selection changed, the other service was listening for that, and then there was one bit in the Redux store where we always stored the ID for the current car that was being selected, but then that was the entirety of the contract. We didn't store much else. 
So now this thing that was rendering potentially that wall box had to go to its own backend and say, hey, I have a new vehicle identifier selected. Is this a car that might require my services, that might require a wall box? And then the HTTP endpoint would come back to say true. It might be, and then that component, that little service itself would render itself. So again, you can do that, but really you should try to limit, again, the, the, the surface area of the contracts between the individual micro front ends you're writing. It is very, very simple to create events running in the web browser, and I guess most of you remember the days before React, when we had other frameworks, like, I don't know what they call it, FlyJS and so on, where you had all these massive events, and you clicked on one thing, and you had 50 events, because everything was triggering everything else. It is very easy to recreate that hell if you start communicating too much between the front ends. And then the last thing that people ask about a lot is that's all well and good, you're talking a lot about web applications, but what about mobile applications? And honestly, I don't have an answer for that. Basically, you have a problem. And the problem is the App Store, right? I mean, what, what, what good is it if you have individual things you could deploy separate from another if they all have to go through the App Store anyway? So the only way you basically can do is what I called the anti-pattern early on, you're just putting all the things together in a mostly automated way, and then you ship it, and there's automation these days, of course, there's this, whatever they call fast lane or bit rise as a specialized CI server for that even, and then you deploy it to the App Store. There are some open source frameworks, I forget their name, but if you want to know, I can find it out again. There are some frameworks that allow you to componentize a native mobile application, but all the deployment benefits you're not getting because deployment of a mobile application is through the App Store. And with that said, thank you. But we do have time for questions. Thank you very much. And for also mentioning Autoscout, uh, and, and Rio also does microphone, that's just to repeat that part. <laughs> Questions for, for this great talk. Oh, I'm just asking all the way in the back. You just want to see me running, don't you? <laughs> so, none of your patterns included iframes, and I wonder why. Is there a good reason? There is a good reason. They are somewhere between a pattern and an anti pattern. You can use iframes, but oftentimes they come with a lot of drawbacks as well. So I did the easy way out and didn't mention them. <laughs> but you can, I mean, that, sometimes they are a reasonable approach, but oftentimes, like I said, they are also not such a great approach. Satisfied? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or were you hoping that I'm saying, oh my god, I forgot, this is the best solution ever? I mean, do, do you have an opinion on this? Do you think iframes are overlooked or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Overlook, because we introduced them and they work pretty well. And when you say we? Real. 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 Ah, sorry. <laughs> so there is a talk lurking. Micro front ends via iFriends. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you definitely get this separation, right? I mean, you have, you have the outer one, the iframe, and the iframe is loaded from a different end, but I get that. So there was. Someone over here. Yes. One question about the single page application. Do you happen to have the setup in your personal repo or something like that? So you can have no, I don't. That's probably something I should do. It's a good point. Yes. It would be awesome. Yeah. Or maybe somebody else. Yes. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Do it. I mean, <laughs> I guess if you if you search for my name, you can find my website, and there is a recording of this talk from earlier this year. And I think they have also the slide deck, or just mail me and I can give you the slide deck, and that should be enough to, uh, to piece this together. But I guess what you want to do is you want more than the code. The thing is, I took the code snippets from a real application and changed some of the names around and then cut things, but if you take everything that I have here, it doesn't run. You know what I mean? Like you need to build a pipeline and all sorts of other things. But yeah, I would be grateful if somebody else did it. <laughs> Are there any frameworks that already take this approach and help you build uh, or put this pattern into use? There are a number of frameworks, I think. I can't speak about any of them. I have not used any of them. I, I'm in the position at least, I mean, as I mentioned before, ThoughtWorks, 
We have about 6,000 people now in 14 countries, so not that small anymore. And twice a year we write the technology radar, which is a complete grassroots exercise. So we really ask on the internal software development mailing list, but also through other mechanisms, the people, the, the software developers, the content developers, the experience designers, and so on, is there anything new that happened in the last six months? And that is what we take together and then produce this um, technology radar. And I'm a member of the group that creates the radar, and nobody so far has mentioned any of those frameworks. I do know they exist, but as I said, normally when something works well and is in more widespread use, somebody will mention it, especially when it's a new field. I mean, of course, almost every edition somebody will mention the new JavaScript framework. It got a little bit better now. It got a little bit better, but you know what I mean. And so far, even though we, and, and, I'm very aware of a number of, actually more, like more like 10, 20 companies around the world that are building products with similar approaches, and so far nobody has recommended, or that's recommended, that's wrong. Nobody has mentioned, neither said anything good nor bad about the existing framework. But I know some exist, and I know others are being written as well. And it is, it lends itself to it, right? I mean, what I showed you was very formulaic. It is just maybe a matter of time filming for an open source project <laughs> to build. There You'll were, get a few stars, I guess, for that one. Yeah. There were two open source, I'm not so sure whether the second one was open source, but in the comment section, the people were actually just comparing frameworks. Okay. So maybe there's somebody in the audience who has written a framework, no? At least one. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question more about um, UX and what you in the NC. Because, for example, if I own my part of the UI, right, I want to change slightly, maybe increase the space, I want to take more space, and right, I need to go to another team and ask, look, I want to actually expand my component, you need to shrink yours, and then suddenly all the teams are also involved. Yes. So there is also, and maybe also follow, me, follow up on that also regarding the CSS and the styles, because you want to have your UI in one common way. Because I, for example, AWS console, it sometimes part of the UI looks like from 80s, then part of the UI looks like modern, then what, what's your experience with this and how people uh, deal with that? So let me start with the first question, that is the easier one to answer. Yes, if you change the layout of the page, then at some point you have to talk. There is no way. I mean, this is not avoiding talk completely. You can't. At some point you have to talk to each other, whether you take that approach or any other approach. If you really change the layout, you have to change. Oftentimes, so today, because you have responsive applications, you have different form factors and so on, there's usually quite an amount of flex involved that allows you to do that, like smallish changes. If you're making more radical changes, you have to coordinate, absolutely. The second question about the CSS, there's different approaches to this. There's um, one thing I've seen used is CSS modules, actually. So the individual applications did have their own CSS, and I know what you mean with Amazon, you can also see it at Deutsche Bahn. I've seen it, we use, we have, in the past, we used something called Agencia, which is a business travel portal by Expedia, it has the same effect. Some parts of the application look a bit newer, some of them look a bit older. It depends, I would say. I mean, if you, especially if you're writing an application, maybe for internal users, so maybe that is actually acceptable and preferable over this huge coordination overhead just to make 100% sure it's always the same. And similar thing that we've seen quite a bit now are design systems, and there's a lot of tooling like Storybook.js, or I forget the names of those tools, but you know, the ones where you have a little server running where everybody can see the components, where you can get a style guide, a living style guide that's created, and you can take those components in your application. So in that case, you probably have some redundancy, and the CSS is probably copied into multiple places. But then, if somebody really goes out and says, we are now changing, and all the buttons that used to have like a four pixel radius and were visibly rounded, they now only have a two pixel radius because that's the new corporate style, then you probably will have multiple teams having to make the copy. It is always a trade-off. Yeah. But I would argue that too often people err on the side of saying we must enforce a completely consistent UI. It must be impossible that the UI can be inconsistent. And they enforce that without understanding the cost they incur by doing that. And I would argue oftentimes it's much, much better to be in a position where it becomes a coordination problem that all the buttons look exactly the same, rather than having each and every deployment the coordination over it. And remember, these e-commerce websites have 500, 600 deploys per week. You don't want any coordination overhead there. 
And again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book that came out last year called Accelerate. This is from the people who wrote the State of DevOps report. I love the book. It really gave a scientific grounding to many of my prejudices or the anecdotal things that I had um, experienced before. And what they have shown relatively conclusively in this book is they have shown four key metrics. And what they're taught, and they can show that these four key metrics correlate with high IT performance and actually mostly also with high business performance. And one of the four key metrics is lead time. How long does it take from checking in to then being available in production? And this is not when Nicole Forsman has a PhD and the, the second half of the book is only about the methodology. This is really relatively sound showing that the lead time has a huge impact on the IT performance as well as on the business performance. So again, anything that stands between you and production is a problem. And the, the complete, I don't know, safety net that it must look the same, if that stands between you and production, you probably should remove it. Totally agree with that one. And the funny part in there is always very successful companies are mentioned. Not everything looks the same. Yeah. So AWS, quite successful, but we can bear with it. Amazon Retail, not every page looks the same, quite successful. Though. I rather learn from them than from the beautiful page and the coordination overhead that they might have, but they're not that successful. Yeah. And there's different approaches. I forget what the name is. There's one tool now that uses, um, I didn't even know it existed. You can use some backticks in JavaScript now to do some literal templating under, in, in something. And they use that to inject CSS now in the JavaScript. So if you want to style some buttons, you can do that. So, so there are ways of, of separating the CSS. And then I think I mentioned this earlier, there's this old <coughs> thing called BEM. I forget what it stands for, but it's a naming convention for CSS elements to make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes when you have completely, because all the CSS that I showed you, they're loaded basically into the same namespace, right? The browser doesn't do namespace, unless you use iframes, I guess. <laughs> All web components. All web components, for that matter, yeah. Further questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my question is about single page applications, I guess. So, for me, that story looks like a um, lazy loading of uh, huge modules in your. Mm -hmm single page application and uh, that approach is really easy to implement using uh, for example the situation that we can see on the first picture on, on that slide where you have uh, two dedicated modules um, and they are isolated somehow like a um, detail page and a shopping cart page but uh, in the real world the situation is a little bit complicated and there are dependencies, right? So the page with the sneakers should know that there is a component which is called shopping cart displayed. Mm -hmm. And the definition or and implementation of the shopping cart should be known for that detail page, right? So mm -hmm. there is a dependency. Yes. And you cannot simply um, solve the dependency uh, using the shown approach, right? So, I mean, um, to build details page you need to build shopping cart first. So even even that the code of uh, these two modules are decoupled. Yeah I think I mean yeah you're right. I mean of course if I do this what I did here right oops see what I did here right I mean this is the shopping cart, oh, sorry, this is the detail page, and at the top, yeah. in line 8 and 9, it says there's a cart preview tile. This is coming from the other JavaScript. Yes, of course, it not, does need to exist. But the thing is, if I'm programming the article detail page, and I don't have a shopping cart, then I don't include lines 8 and 9. And the ah, moment I'm wait, 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 so that's the code for detail yes. page. Yes, yes. Ah, I thought it's some uh, framing page that knows about all modules in the system and loads all these modules. You can do that too. It doesn't matter. Right. At some point you need to, at some point you have a set of different microservices, right? right? Which means you also have a set of micro-frontends. And somebody needs to know all the micro-frontends. 
whether you have one component that knows all of the microservices, or you have one component that knows one, which knows another one. Transitively, you always know all of them. And yeah, you're right, if it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, but then you don't include it. Huh? I mean, the moment somebody rides a shopping cart, then you can start including it. Maybe we can make a drawing on a napkin later. All right. Actually, you can just stay there. I just got to. Um, I kind of missed it, but I see in your presentation that you have lots of J uh, J uh, JSON and JavaScript being uh -huh. shipped between server and client. Uh -huh. But the markup I see nowhere. Um, did I miss that? Or, like, for instance, the, the markup for your uh, nice little auto detail that you showed in the beginning. Uh, sorry, this, this code here, maybe I need to restructure the presentation. This code here in the pattern number five, all of this is React. And in React, you don't ship HTML. So the HTML is part of your, of your React whole framework, then? Right? Oh, so, ah, I see, okay, I need to recapture my audience. In React, you are shipping only JavaScript, and all the HTML is rendered in the web browser. There is by, no by the JavaScript? Yes. Okay. There is no server side running of HTML. I mean, you can do it, but you generally don't. Right. I was just thinking about something like Angular, where you have your HTML templates, and your TypeScript class, and your CSS, and all right. that. Yeah. But okay, so you basically just generate JavaScript that creates the HTML. Yes, exactly. Thanks. Any more credit? Yeah, just. <laughs> just take some time. So if you have a page which is composed out of like small pages, right? And how do you deal with the loading? So is it also again acceptable if one page is loaded and then you see suddenly like something came out here and then something came out here? So it's not synchronized. So it's not an instant, right? So for example, from server side, okay, it's instant. It's rendered once. It's fine. With the SPA, and then you will see like your page is blinking. Something is appearing because. For example, one microservice responds really fast, another one is slower, and then this whole the, the time for loading the whole page will be then the time of loading the slowest front end. So do you usually synchronize it or are you like okay, let it be and will just appear randomly? It completely depends on the application. It's hidden, I mean in this solution here it's hidden in this line, twenty eight, promise all. And I said can't promise, dot dot dot. So the other ones would be here and that would only start to work when all the JavaScript has been loaded. Yeah, because usually when I, when I go, because when I open internet web, websites, it's instant. I don't see the loading. I'm just curious how SP, if I use SPA approach, how do I achieve it that it's instant? Because I mean, either all of them are super fast. Defined, exactly, defined instant, right? Yeah, like I don't see this user, so it's yes. so fast that I don't know. There's like 100 millisecond rule or something. Your eye doesn't see that something is changing. Yeah, probably. So, I mean. 60, I mean, 60 FPS is often what Yes, yeah, so either it's so, so fast, like all of them are loaded that you don't realize it, but... Uh, yeah, it depends, I mean, you can, there's two different phases, right? One is the transmission of all the content over the network from the server side to the web browser, the other one is the rendering inside the web browser. I would argue once, if you do this here, this will only start, mostly only start rendering once all the data is there. So this shouldn't, fl this shouldn't show any flicker, it should just render everything, and the browsers are so fast, and in React you have the shadow DOM, which makes it appear nice, that it would appear as if this one, if it comes from one thing. You can do it differently, for example, if you have, I can show you this actually, and in very rare cases, ah, come on, and now I hate all the animations. <laughs> Here. So this is, as I said, from my personal website, for example, it can actually load the HTML, but if this one here that goes to the GitHub, the Git is slower than my own web server. If Git is slower than my web server, my web page would be rendered and it would say, class, and it would have a little text here saying loading. And then when this JavaScript has been executed, it will then again client side, render all the HTML, and will stick the HTML in there and overwrite this paragraph. And then you will see the picture. And, and a lot of the major websites do a lot of optimization yeah. of above the fold and below yeah, the yeah. fold and you, you mentioned uh, 
Amazon before. If you if you scroll on the Amazon side, you see how some of the stuff gets loaded below the fold. So that's an optimization strategy where and when content needs to be present. So it's more or less yeah. an additional thing to optimize for. Yeah, and the framework that I mentioned earlier, GetSpeed.js. I mean, they do this. It's a new fancy acronym for Jamstack, for JavaScript, API, and Markup. So the idea is similar to this pattern here, that you don't, for your solution, you try not to write any code that runs on the server. So you try to do all the rendering, you do static side, like this one here, you try to render everything in JavaScript, and then you use like a hosted content management system somewhere, or some other software as a service. And they, as I said, they, mentioned, they do all these tricks of like above the fold, but also, they only load the ones you need on the first page, but while you as a human being are looking at the first page in the background, they already, unbeknown to you, are loading things preemptively because you might go there so that then when you go to the next page, it looks faster. There's a lot of optimization potential and it really, really depends on how sophisticated your users are, how big your application is, how good the network connection is, and how much time you have. Because it's the, the more complex you make it, the more time you have to spend programming it. Okay, the one in the back was faster. <coughs> uh, first, I want to thank you for the talk, but where is it closing back for P? <laughs> Say again? Where is it closing? Where is it closing tag for P? Do you want to have that argument? I think we are now almost ready for peer. You know, that is very Visual Studio Code, which is my normal go to editor these days, almost makes me put the slash P's in there because it really screws up the formatting every time when you don't close your containers. But P is not a container in HTML5. Okay, um, single page applications usually have a lot of configuration or setup in the repository. Do you usually just copy that for every micro front end, like Wi Fi configuration, linters, and yeah. pipeline configurations? Do you copy this, or is there a better solution? No, so far we've mostly copied them. I mean, colleagues have talked about seed works, so it's almost like not a framework, but you, you seed it, you copy it. There's this thing uh, that we call tailored service template, so when you do lots of microservices that you maintain somewhere a template, and the idea is that you check out something from Git, and that gives you hello world, but also the server side, and there's a lot of other things you need to do, like how do you hook up into the monitoring system, how, and all these things, they are in the service template. And the service template, then you can also use the pipeline. But sometimes you can just use create, like what is it called, like create red type or whatever, the scaffolding thing, and just use that one. But you yeah, are trying to, the thing is, Trying to do these frameworks inside a company is incredibly hard because you don't give anybody time, no matter what your intentions are, but practically, nobody has time to maintain those. And then they always fall into disrepair, people are not using it, they're not updating it, you can't rely on them. If you just say, here, copy this, and it kind of works better in practice. In theory, not. <laughs> Okay, last one. <laughs> in the back end, microservices, there's always like the problem, how do you define them, the boundaries? And uh -huh. so on. Is it the same kind of thing than the front end? How do you define, okay, those screens will go up to this team? Or? No, it's trivial. It's trivial because or you just whatever belongs to the back end belongs to the front end. So either use business capabilities, bounded context, and whatever. It's the same. Once, once you know what belongs together on the service side, you know what belongs together on the content side. <coughs> so now I have a, a question: Who is actually doing micro front ends in the audience? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about a third. Are you doing that in uh, front end style React kind of micro front ends? So. Pattern number five? Yeah. Who's doing pattern number five or similar? Yeah, all three. <laughs> <laughs> You've picked the anti patterns. Uh, that's good. <laughs> I can't hear you.
Well, we have this, and we have all three, three, uh, three frameworks, and we communicate through App Shell, and we have uh, web components, and it's no problem to integrate all the three uh, stuff. We have made this, but with all three frameworks. And in the background, every microservice has a Docker, yeah. but, uh, something in Scotland, and Kafka in the background. And Sounds like a microservice that's not coming out. And, and, and <laughs> this works really great is, is to combine all the three stuff. Are you, are you volunteering for a hands on what, what you actually built there? Yeah. Okay, ping me afterwards. Yeah. Sounds interesting, so this, this looks promising. And when you say all three, do you mean React, Vue, and Angular, or do you mean React, Vue, and Angular? Ah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want to be part of you. <laughs> what is the onboarding when you develop this? <laughs> so, the, the remainder of the conversation of a beers, uh, non SPR like, micro front end, server side rendering, those kind of things. Anybody still using those techniques? Nobody anymore. Oh. So the autoscout mentioning was for nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> autoscout for you, I guess. I didn't saw any hands going up. We still use them. So you were too shy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Great talk. Stay over for more beer and pizza. And have those micro